Good morning, church. Holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and high priest whom we confess. He was faithful to God the Father who appointed him just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Of course, Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, testifying to what would be said in the future, but Christ is faithful as a son over God's house. And we, the church, are his house if we hold on to our courage and the hope of which we boast. Praise God who has blessed us in so many ways. Please stand. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here.
goodness I would be desperate without your love slave to the darkness if it was Thank you, Lord, that you went to the cross willingly, obediently, and even lovingly because you saw us, even those of us 2,000 years away in the future. You died for us. And those yet to come, 
God, we, we just can't thank you enough for what you have done. We could not have done this ourselves, but we owed the debt to you. And yet the Lord Jesus willingly went and died in our stead. Thank you for your grace, Lord. And it's in that grace and in your love that we come to worship you today. May the love that you have given us be returned to you from our grateful hearts. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. Good morning. I'm so thankful. It's so awesome that you chose to worship with us this morning. And uh, we pray that you feel welcome. We don't do this every Sunday, but uh, I, I see John passing those out, but I'm going to go ahead and have you do this. Would you just stand and greet one another and just say hello to each other? Would you do that, please? I know some people just walked in. Good morning. <laughs> They're going to say hi to you. Yeah. Yeah. Happy fall break. Happy fall break. Hey. Oh, perfect. Thank you for letting me know that. Email. It's always a fear when we start this. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. <laughs> I was just thinking, yeah, uh, when we do that, we start, it's, it's hard to get, we get started talking, and it's awesome. So, so thank you for doing that. Uh, several things that we want to share with you this morning. Uh, lots happening in the, the body of Christ, and we're, we're thankful for that. And, you know, I, I know that things are, are really busy, and I, I, I appreciate that. Uh, but I also want you to know there's been a lot of thought put into everything that we're, we're a part of, and, and it's about intentionally. How do, we, how do we help people grow up in the love of Jesus Christ? That's our mission. It's on the front of the bulletin every Sunday is that leading people into this relationship with Christ is what we're all about and everything that's happening. But just to give you an update from last week, because, uh, by the way, I'm, I'm going solo this week. No, no Luther. Uh, so pray for me. <laughs> Actually, you should have prayed for me last week. Um, but last week uh, in, in the fundraiser for Israel, and I just want to give you an update of this, uh, over $2,900 were brought in. Praise God for that. Yes. Um, Luther's trip is, is fully funded now. We praise God for that because uh, where Luther serves in Kansas City, you know their church, they're unable to raise those kind of funds for their pastor to go. And uh, Luther told me, I just talked to him yesterday afternoon, and he especially wanted me to sh send this message of thank you. Uh, he was so blessed in being here, and it was such a huge blessing to him and his wife that they get to go to Israel. Uh, and, you know, giving to that, and, and the, also some other additional things, because we have two young ladies that we prayed for, uh, others, with, young people would be opportunities to go, and Kelsey and Courtney are going with us this year, or next year as well. And so, uh, one of the things I wanted to mention with that, because now we have 21 signed up to go to Israel, the impact of this is uh, walking the steps of Jesus is going to impact everyone that's going, and, and bringing it back bringing it back to our, our home churches and our community. And, and so I, I want you to keep praying. And also there's still time. If there's individuals, if you'd like to go or would like to have a conversation about it, and I, I want you to know we will do everything we can to help to, to make that happen because it is such a special, special trip. Yesterday, just give you another update. Um, I am so thankful for this, this young lady right here, Michelle and, and Jessica leaders and, and also all the leaders in the, the middle school, uh, 17, 17 kids at the, their first mission trip together with us. Uh, we went to Camp Kamika for a rally, and uh, I did go and I did survive. 
uh, with middle schoolers. It was awesome, but it, what an incredible time. Our kids, we have awesome kids, and, and Michelle is doing an incredible job with our, our middle schoolers. Also, I just wanted to just make a comment on the letter we sent out to people uh, attending the church as well as membership. That, that's just to inform you of what's going on in the church. Uh, there's lots of things happening. We, you know, our commitment as elders and the leadership team is that we want to commu- over-communicate with you what's happening. And so that is just an information uh, just to keep you informed of everything that's going on within the church. We did have one change. It's gonna, the congregational meeting will be November 10th, not the 3rd. Well, we've moved that to the 10th, not the 3rd, because uh, we have Hispanic service on the 3rd, and so we wanted to make sure and have time for that. So I, I love what's coming up this Saturday. It's Family Fun Night, and uh, Don and Karen are doing a great job leading this and getting it started. They're smiling. <laughs> and uh, lots need to happen this week. We pray that you take some time, sign up. We need everybody that we can to, to, to serve in our community. This is a huge outreach. And it's a blast. It's a blast. So make sure you look into that. If you have questions, uh, Don, Karen, you want to raise your hand so you can see that stand up. There we go. Ask them they have, if you, they can help you with that. Or any of us in leadership would be happy to do that. I know we have a couple of announcements. I don't know which one. Mel, you want to go first? So oftentimes it's a pivotal point in your life as far as where you wind up in life. I think that uh, as Pastor Tim mentioned as far as the youth group, my decision to follow Christ and be fully dedicated to Christ was when I was at age 13, just going into eighth grade. And so our mission statement this year for our key verse is without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so a step of faith in the right direction is a pivotal point in your life that's going to make a difference for your whole world. And that pivotal point will wind up bringing you to the cross of Jesus Christ. And I think it's appropriate today that my decision to be dedicated to Christ was, I want to recognize my uh, junior high pastor, which means this is Pastor Recognition Sunday, Sam Lehman, why this summer, just going into eighth grade, he talked about Jesus coming back for his bride, the church. And I think it's so wonderful that Pastor Tim is dedicating Uh, this time of service to uh, the emphasis of what church can do in your life. And so not only do I want to recognize my pastor, but I would like for you that don't know Michelle Simmons to stand because she is our junior high trek leader. And would the rest of the leaders stand as well? that is leading junior high. Mm -hmm. We got some awesome leaders that are pointing our youth in the right direction. And so our missions conference this year, the reason that I'm up here is uh, November 23rd and 24th. And Saturday morning, we're going to find out what the church is doing in Africa. Why that this one person from 2010 to to today, and the figures are already outdated, but he has established over 8,000 churches in this time frame. And so our missions catalyst, Carrie Rillahan, is going to talk to us as far as on that Saturday morning. Another pivotal point that you will want want to miss because this can make all the difference in the world. And there's two words why this, uh, all the churches are being planted in Africa. And I'm not gonna share that with you. You gotta come Saturday morning and find out what those two words are 
why there's such an impact of happening in uh, the churches in Africa, and as far as that goes, many other countries. And so, uh, with Carrie Rillhand, the reason that I shared about making a dedication of my life, and, and he, our pastor talked about Jesus coming back in the clouds to rapture his bride, today is very appropriate, because every time I looked up that summer, and saw the clouds in the sky, I wondered, is Jesus coming back today? Well, Pastor Kerry Rillahan, our missions catalyst, is going to talk about Jesus coming back for his church and, and what's going to happen. So the rest of the missions conference, uh, Thanksgiving evening uh, supper for November 23rd, and then November 24th in Sunday school and church, he will be talking about Christ coming back, the importance of that in our lives. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Mel. Yeah, really important. Kerry is a, uh, love hanging out with Kerry. He's a sharp guy. He'll be sharing well. Larry, come on up. And Larry, he's got a, an announcement about body life. So good morning. Um, on behalf of the Body Life uh, Committee, uh, we're having a newcomer's uh, meal immediately after church. Uh, if you've been coming to our um, family, church family, and you consider yourself fairly new in the last year, uh, feel free to join us. Uh, we're gonna have a pulled pork, uh, et cetera, lunch. And we promise you that you'll be home by one o'clock, so it's not gonna be long. And we're hoping that you'll meet some new people and learn some uh, things about the ministries of the church. So join us immediately um, after the service uh, for a newcomer's lunch. Yes, Jerry. It depends on where they live as to whether they be home by one. Well, good point. <laughs> we'll, we'll have you out the door by one. Yeah. And um, just as a motivation, you might want to come to see if we fulfill that promise. Otherwise, you won't know. So please join us. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Thanks, Larry. We uh, want to spend just a few minutes now in prayer. Uh, we have a praise. Krista, uh, uh, Mary, Mary Ann's daughter, uh, she is healed. The leg is healed. Praise God. Praise God. You know, I, I, uh, morning like today is tough. I, I hate cancer. I just hate it. And I, I've been praying for Mike, and would you please just continue to lift up Mike? Uh, he had an MRI this morning, and uh, the, the cancer is, is raging. And uh, we just want to continue to lift up Mike. And this week has been especially hard. Um, a gentleman, and I'll be sharing a little bit about it in the message, a, a dear friend of mine from high school uh, was, has been diagnosed with cancer, and he, he, I spoke with him last night, and his, his time is very short. Uh, and uh, we talked about it's a homecoming. But, you know, I can't imagine what it's like to be facing these kinds of things without Christ, without any hope. And uh, as we look at the list in your bulletin, you'll notice that list of the many people listed here. Some are, are, are getting well, and some are going to be well in heaven. And I, I just, uh, just encourage you, to take that list and pray. And if there's others, too, that we can be praying for, and I, I would ask you to add Perry Cox to that list, my friend, our friend. And Liz, his, his wife. And I, I know there are many around us that are suffering this way, and I, I just want to take some time and pray. Father, we, we just uh, lift these folks up to you. Lord, I thank you that you are, you are the author of life, you oversee all of life. Lord, we confess we don't understand sometimes the suffering and, and the hardship, but we know that you're good and that you're faithful. And, and Lord, I, I, I think of uh, Dan and Wanda's granddaughter healing, the, the, the surgery that happened this week, and the good results. Nat, you know, his knees improving. 
But I, I know that there are others that it's, it's not the news that we'd like to hear. It's a different news. But Lord, we, we, we acknowledge that you're the author of life. You're the giver of life. You, you put all these things together that we cannot understand. And we, we just cry out to you for your mercy, your hand of comfort, your wisdom. And Lord, we just lift these folks up to you. And Lord, I know there are many in this room that some of it, it may be financial that struggled, the struggle of how they're going to make ends meet. Lord, we, we just cry out to you now. We just lift them before you. We know that you are faithful. And Lord, if there's something that you have put on our hearts, I pray that you give us the courage that we won't hesitate. We will step out of our comfort zone and go to people. Go to one another. Love one another. That's what the church is about. Lord, we just lift all these folks to you now. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Please stand with us again.
Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he was without sin. Let us then approach the, grain, the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the wonderful grace that you have extended for your church. Oh 
Jesus, thank you. You rescued us by the cross. And we thank you that, that you have opened our eyes and softened our hearts and opened our ears and allowed us to believe in you. Lord Jesus, that we would pay you back, but we can't because the cost is too great, the precious blood of Jesus. But we give you what we can. We give you our lives our hearts, our service, all of us, and also, Lord, an offering, an offering of material things that you have given us. We give that back to you to use that, Lord, in whatever way you choose to further your kingdom, to bring more into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So receive our offering now. We pray for your glory. Amen. May be seated. If you would uh, take out your Bibles, and if you'd uh, join me in 1 John, uh, not regular John, 1 John, it's in the way in the back of the Bible. Uh, I don't have the page numbers, I think they're, uh, if you have a, use a few Bible, there's, there's Bibles in front of you, but it's 1 John chapter 2. Would you please stand? 
We stand because this is the anointed holy word of God. Do you realize what you hold in your hand is the precious word of God. And we stand in, in honor of this. And I, and I, I want to pray before I read today. Lord, I, I pray that you just uh, fill this room with your spirit. That you move in our hearts. That you help us to understand the, what you want us to, to take away today. So we want to take it to our minds and surrender it now into our hearts and pray for your will, your power to live it out. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 John chapter 2, starting at verse 7 through 14. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it's a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know who, him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Again, Lord, I just pray you speak to us now. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. It is uh, time for Children's Church. I can hear those little feet running. It's awesome. I'm glad that they love going there. And you know, also, when you get a chance, thank the people that serve there on Sunday mornings because uh, they're stepping up in a powerful way, pouring into kids, and it's an awesome thing. Uh, th we are in a series around the church. And uh, I, I must admit that it is probably one of the most confuse, confusing things in our culture. And, and especially even in the church community, it's somewhat confusing. Uh, you remember the first message on this, some of you, uh, if you may recall, uh, it was around, it was from Ephesians chapter 5, 25 through 28, and, and it basically, it boils down to this, is that Jesus loves the church, he died for the church, he shed his blood for the church, he loved the church, and if you remember in contrast in our culture today, that 80% of people, even some of them are Christians, are saying church is optional. And that, that is a way of our culture. That's nothing new. In fact, it was in, in the church of Corinth to start saying and thinking like somehow the church is optional. And you heard in that message, no, it's not optional. As a believer in Christ, I am to be a part of a body. A body of Christ. I am a part of this body. And, and you know, by the way, I, I just want to encourage you because you see in the bulletin, we have it open for membership. And membership in the E-Free Church is very simple. If you confess with your mouth that Lord Jesus Christ is Lord, that He came, He died on the cross, He rose again, and He's coming again, and who all who put their belief in Him will be saved, that's membership. Because it's a membership into the body of Christ. And the one step that is absolutely necessary is that you step forward, you confess your faith in Jesus Christ, and you are a qual qualified for membership. The question is, how, how many are reluctant to step up and make that commitment? And, and we're encouraging you. We need your stepping up. I, I want to encourage you, if you have never stepped up and made a commitment into the body of Christ, into a membership of the church, I pray this morning, you prayerfully consider that. And, and if you have some thoughts around that, ask me or Doug, and uh, there's meetings coming up, and we'll help you understand that. Not a, lot of, lot of, not a lot of meetings and those kinds of things. Basically, to affirm your faith, 
and help you to start growing up. And that's really what this message is about today. Last week you heard Luther and a little bit of me. Just a little bit. Uh, really, you know, our, our hearts were that we would show the unity and that we would live in that. You know, I had a couple of people ask, did you practice that? We purposely did not. We, we wanted to just come in the unity of Christ. And, and last week was all about the glorious, precious gospel of which we get to send the message of the gospel through the church. That even angels long to look into the message we have to share. That's what last week was about. This week, it's about family. I, I don't know about you, but uh, when you hear the word family, your mind immediately probably goes to your immediate family. You know, coming up with the holidays, you know what a holiday family was like in the Peterson household? Everybody came, and mom had to make mashed potatoes and corn. That was first. had to be there. And then it would be ham or whatever. And, and she would do all the work pre preparing the meal and that kind of stuff. We'd have this huge meal, have uh, pumpkin pie and all that kind of stuff. And then everybody would retire to the living room and sleep. It was a big snore. Nobody talked. I, I'm serious. Uh, when Sherry came in and was like, is this what you guys do? Yeah, pretty much. After we wake up, we eat again. And then we go home. You know, a lot of times that's confusing, isn't it? Because a lot of us have this confusing message of when you hear family, what is it? And, and you know, in the church family, it, 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 we are called into this family. And this morning, I, I pray that you open your ears and go, okay, what is God telling us about the family? If you have your Bibles, jump, jump into Mark with me. Mark 3, 31. Mark 3, 31. And these are kind of shocking. If you've not seen these, I pray this morning that God speaks to you about what is family. So when we're talking about the church family, it's very, very unique. Mark chapter 3, Mark chapter 3, verse 31. I want you to see this. Fairly early in the ministry of our Lord, he was with a group of the apostles or the disciples. And we see here in Mark chapter 3, 31, And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called to him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. More than likely, we know that's probably James, and we're not sure of the others, but brothers, meaning plural, so there were several of them. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. I don't know about you, but the first time I remember reading that, I was a little floored. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> he didn't go out? We don't know. He, he said succinctly, Who are my family? Those who live out the will of God. Am I to assume then that, that, that they're not? Not sure of that either. But they didn't go in. Or at least we don't know if they did. And, and actually, one of the things that's going to be shocking to most of us, and I found this to be true in my own life, is like when I became a Christian, it was like, wait a second. That meant all of a sudden I was getting even more distance about my family. And I, it shocked me a little bit because my family... Uh, my brothers and sisters in Christ and my church family were becoming more significant than them. When we had a dinner together, we didn't take a nap. We talked. We, we challenged each other. We prayed with each other. We had scriptures open. Well, let me even take you a little further. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, just a little bit to the left. Matthew chapter 10. Jesus gets very succinct about this now. Chapter 10, verse 34. Matthew 10, 34. Jesus' words, Do you think that I've come to bring peace to the earth? I have not. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. You know what a sword's for? Cutting. 
A double-edged sword does it really well. It's for cutting. And you go, wait a minute. Lord, you, you came bringing a sword? For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. I could spend, we could spend hours on that passage. You understand what Jesus is saying? The church family, the family that we share, brothers and sisters in Christ, is very unique. The first point on your bulletin is a transformational community is a unique creation of God. And and it's going to boggle your mind sometimes when you think about it. It's like, and and I I don't know how many times I've wrestled with it personally, and I've sat across the room with someone that's wrestled with it. Why, Why is it that I get so close to people in the church, but not so with my own brothers? I've asked myself this question many times. I have two older brothers. I've reached out to them many times over the years. And some days, you know, i got to confess that I just kind of gave up. And, and they, they, you know, I remember the comments when I stepped into being a pastor. They thought that was very weird. Those are kind words. <laughs> they, they thought I was nuts. And, and they didn't understand and all of a sudden, you know, and, and even now conversations with them is kind of like, I, I can only go so far. It's not like this. It's th- this unique transformation in our, our coming together in Christ. It's a unique creation that God has made for the church. And, and every one of us coming into this, in fact, the story I want to share with you about it is probably two of the most unlikely people became best friends. Perry Cox and Tim Peterson. Perry Cox was a, we both wrestled, he was a senior and I was a sophomore, and he was at the weight class I wanted to be in. And so we had to wrestle off every week. If you've ever been in a wrestling room with wrestling, wrestle-offs, it's usually, and when it doesn't go well, and you're Tim Peterson, it usually ends up in a fist fight. Because <laughs> that, that's how competitive we were. We did not like each other. Okay, we did, we hated each other. Uh, that's the way we started. In fact, it, and then I, I, you know, and, and he beat me the whole time. I, I never, never, never did beat him in a wrestle-off. And so that meant I got to be the one to lose weight, go down to 126. Thank you, Perry. And, uh, it, you know, that was our relationship. We go our separate ways, and, 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 and Perry, would, would, if he were here today, he would tell you that he became a, a, an addict. And his life became a mess. And when I became a Christian, I, I, I got to know his parents, Doris and Martin Cox, and specifically Doris. And we began to pray for Perry that he would come to faith. And uh, we watched Doris, Doris get cancer, brain, brain tumor. And we watched Doris go home. And still Perry didn't come. And a few months passed, and Perry showed up at church, and shortly after that, I got the chance to start meeting with Perry and sharing the gospel. And two enemies became best friends, and he accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior. And we became partners in the CR, Celebrate Recovery Ministry. And we began to work together, two of the most unlikely and, and we talked about it often. In fact, we would, and, and he used to just joke with me. He says, this is a guy I hated. Sometimes he would start the meeting like that. He said, oh yeah, we hated each other, but, but isn't God awesome? He made us friends. More than that, we became brothers. I, I want you to join me. This transformational community, Titus speaks of this. And I, I think I have this in the uh, up front is for the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people all people training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions do you understand what say what teaches us to say no to ungodliness it's grace 
It's not rules. It's grace. It is the grace of Jesus Christ that teaches me to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age. This is this transformation. This is what the community is to look like. Waiting for our blessed hope. You know, waiting, which really is one of those things that I don't do very well. If you've ever ridden with me in a car, I don't do well with it. I confess. You know, I don't like waiting. I don't like slow vehicles in front of me. You know, you know that, that, I, that waiting is hard, but notice what it says. This grace is teaching me to wait for the glory of God to be revealed. This great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself up to redeem us from all lawlessness and purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. This is this unique community. This is what it looks like. And you see, this new transformed, I'm going to speed up here, this new transformed community is based on spiritual birth. And I pray you follow me for this for a few minutes here. That this new community is based upon this new birth, this new life, this spiritual birth. If you look at, in the passage I just read to you earlier in 1 John chapter 2, 7 and 8, it says, Beloved, I'm writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you have from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have, you have you've already heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him, and in you, take note, true in you and in him, in, in him in us, is this new life, this transformed life because you've been regenerated by the love of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, the gospel. You have been transformed. It's this new birth. This brand new life has been put in us. See, and it's old and new because in the old, and you know, we know this, that, that how, how this is really shown then, this new birth, is how we love one another. Old in Leviticus 19.18, it says, Love your neighbor as thyself. But now we see Jesus speaking of a new command in John 13.34. Jesus says to the apostles, A new commandment I give to you is to love one another. This new birth is supposed to be worked out in how we love one another. How we treat each other in here and out through the week and all the time that we have together is vitally important that we're brothers and sisters in Christ in here as well as out there. That's the mark of this transformed community. That is what the church is to be about. It's a new commandment because it was given to the church. Who was Jesus speaking to when he said that? He said it to the apostles. And the apostles' responsibility was to start his church. And it's new also because at this point we just sang about the cross and the significance of the cross. See, the cross, because of Christ, it is that it's wide enough to include everyone. Everyone is welcome. It is long enough that, that it lasts through eternity. Mike and I were just talking about that this Friday. Talking with Perry about it last night. That this long enough and deep enough deep enough to reach the most guilty sinner and save them, and high enough to take us to heaven. This is this new birth. And because of this rebirth, this spiritual birth, now that we have this new life, this is a brand new transformed community. That's what this is about in terms of who we are now. Now I want you to pay really close attention to these next few points. If you can, stay with me. Every believer enters the family of God needing to overcome brokenness. Every believer enters into this new transformed life, this rebirth in Christ, needing to overcome brokenness. Now, I want you to think about that a minute because this is vital to us as the wellness of this church. Because it is vitally important that we understand that every new person that's coming in has to overcome brokenness. And you know what that means? We get to be a part of helping them in that as they help us. 
This is, this is what church is about. This is why Celebrate Recovery is so big. This is why Bible studies are so big. This is why small groups are so big that we begin to help one another as we enter into this transformed, unique community to start being transformed. I want you to think about this for a minute. I put this passage with this particular point, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. It says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to, to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Every one of us have come out of a worldly perspective, haven't we? Every one of us have come out of this. And, and, and you know, a lot of times we think about provoke, with the things that we have to overcome as we come into the body of Christ, we have to overcome that brokenness from our own life. And, and this isn't to blame parents or grandparents or anything of that nature. Every one of us have to face these things. No family is perfect. You know, when I, you know, most commonly when you think of the word provoke, immediately you go to those abusive situations. And we know those happen. And we have members in this body who have come out of abusive backgrounds, haven't we? You know, that they hear from their parents maybe things like, you'll never amount to anything. Or you're just a, you're just a mess up and there will never be anything good come from you. We have family members of this body who have come from that experience. And they need to understand that, and as they enter in, is that this body of Christ comes along them and loves them through it. Not condemn them but help them. But we also have some that have come for like me. I, I didn't come from an abusive home, but I came from a neglectful home. Because we can provoke people by neglect as well. My family neglected to teach me of what it means to be a follower of Christ. My family didn't pour into me about what it really means to be a man. I was kind of left on my own. And it provoked me. And I, I had to learn this in the body of Christ. And this is what I love about what happened in my life when Bill Henderson came along and he nurtured me, helping me to grow up in this. I'm going to step on some toes. We're watching. Our youngest is at UNL. And, and let me tell you, the, the, the neglect that we see with some of the other kids that he's around, parents have sent their kids to school and the first year, their freshman year of college, they have $22,000 worth of debt. You know, when I look at that, there's a bunch of parents who have not taught their kids about finances, period. You don't think that's going to provoke problems in their life? Yeah, it will. Because we are called to be accountable, responsible in teaching our kids. And I'm not saying that that is, I'm not, making that a legalistic thing. But when I watch, when I hear the, my son talk about these kids spending money like it's water without any accountability, there's been some failure to teach them about the truth. I would add ignorant to provoking. You know, last week, we, Pastor Luther and I talked a lot about this passage. It's in from Ephesians chapter 4, 17, 18, and 19. Now this, I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance. And by the ignorance of not teaching and helping them to understand what the truth is. And I say these things because I want you to think about this as we have people coming in. This is why like financial peace is so important. Helping them to overcome those things and start understanding the truth of how do we live. This is what the body of Christ is called to be, is loving people, loving people through this. Next point, as a believer enters the family of God, examine yourself carefully. As, as we enter in, we are helping one another to examine ourselves very carefully, and carefully in accordance with the Word of God. Going back to the passage in 1 John chapter 2, 9-11. through 11, This is really an examination. And it's one that we all should participate in. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. There's no room for it. 
Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. You know, as Perry came into the body, we started talking a lot about how important it was that we started come along people that we had had disagreements with, people in our lives that we had problems with, people in our lives that we disagreed with, and there was absolutely no room for hate. But the importance of how do we shine the light and love them in. And every one of us have this responsibility to examine this. And I want you to see this progression because the body of Christ is a part of this progressive growing up in the likeness of Christ. You'll notice in the next passage, it says every person is born again, begins as a child. That seems like a no-brainer, doesn't it? Every person, but a lot of people miss that in the church. Every person that is born again, when you're, a person is born again, you know, what, we got two beautiful twins here today. Right back there, just as they grew so much in the last time since I've seen them. And, and you know, so, but they're, they're, we don't, you know, when we see the birth of a child, we're not, we're not taken back by surprise in that. You know, this is a little one. But when a person has become a believer in Jesus Christ, they're a child. They're born again as a child. And, and we make this mistake all the time in church that a person has become a believer. It's like, oh, let's put them in charge of something. How many of you would ever take your toddler, three or four year old, and put them in your combine? Okay, that's happening. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, nobody do that. Why, why do we do this in the church? You, you know, one of the things I loved about Bill Henderson, he, when, when I became a believer, he got his arms around me and he's told people around that knew, you know, that in the church, they said, leave him alone, he's mine. And Bill took a year with just me. And he, and he instructed me this way. He says, you are a child of God. Keyword, child. Look at this passage. 1 John chapter 2, verse 12. I'm writing to you little children. This word in the Greek is tekeia. T-E-K-I-A. Tekeia. And that's literally what it means. Child. Uh, and look at what, what is, is instructed that we're to do with the child. Remind them. Lovingly remind them they're forgiven. Because, you know, as children, we've got to re remind them. Help them to come to know, I'm forgiven. I'm solid in this. Because we're, we start out, every one of us, as a child. I pray we don't miss that as a church. As we bring, as God brings people in, and as we get an opportunity to come around sight of them, we help nurture them up, to grow them up as a, this child to grow up. I, I pray this is making some sense. Now, <clears throat> growth is necessary in God's family. It is necessary in God's family. Later on in the same passage, you'll see I'm writing to you fathers because you know him. This is verse 13. Who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you young men. Because you have overcome the evil one, I write to you children. This time, he uses a different word for children. Padea. Padea. P-A-I-D-I-A. Padea. What this means is the corrective work with the child. The di correction of discipline. That in the body that we're coming alongside, and this is one of the things I go back to, like Bill, for example, he, can, he got his arms around me and he started correcting some of the things that I wasn't thinking accurately according to the Word of God. And, and things that I was doing that would not have been pleasing to Jesus. And, and I, I started to get these things corrected. See, this is what the family of God does. Not in a neglectful way, but in a loving way. Finally, young adults. Young adults are described as overcoming the evil one. These are benchmarks that we should be helping people as they come into the body of Christ. They start as a child. Every one of us starts there. To become a young adult. Look at what he says about the young adult. I'm writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. Overcome the evil one. I, 
Now, what that means is that every one of us, as we grow, we have to come and face those things, probably many of us, that one sin or maybe that one or two sins that just keeps haunting our life, keeps tripping us up, keeps causing us to fail. I, I know one that was one of my friends had financial problems, and he continued to rack up credit card debt. He would get out of debt, and then he would turn around, and he would go right back into credit card debt. And I said to him, I said, you know, you are still functioning like a little child. You're still treating it like, you, like a little kid. Like it manages you. You don't manage it. And until he got to the point that he started to go, wait a second, I have to overcome lust. It was lust. Lust is not sexual. Lust is I want what I want, and I want it now. What's a credit card do? And until he could overcome that, and then he started becoming a man of God. If you ever read Dave Ramsey, he speaks of the very same thing. This is, this is how he talks about it. So young adults are described overcoming that evil one or that sin in their life. And ultimately, what we're called to strive to be in the, in the body of Christ is a parent, a spiritual parent. You know, I will say this about this body. I, I, I so appreciate the many in this body who are working hard to grow up in the likeness of Jesus Christ. The many who are opening their word on a regular basis and seeking, I want to be that kind of person. And it's not just the, the, the more senior group. There are many young people, and I praise God for that. I, I hang out with some other pastors, and I hear some of their stories, and they're talking about, you know, I... I a lot of their people won't even pick up a Bible. We are so blessed here to have so many that are wanting to grow and are hungry for this growth. Look at how he describes it. Let me reread 13 and 14 again. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. In other words, he takes all of the word in. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I'm writing to you, children, because you know the Father. And he says in 14 again, I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. You know, this last piece is this. And, and how we go as a church is having these clear in our minds that we, we are literally understanding as new people come in, our responsibility is to come alongside them and nurture them up. Help them to grow up in this, in grace, in love, in correction, yes, but in grace. And we're to help those young people when they start to reach that young adult in their spiritual walk, to help them to overcome those sins, whatever they may be, that they can live above those things, whether it's financial, whether it's addiction, or whether it's, it's relationships, or wherever that may show itself. And finally, to strive to be that parent. You know, numerous places... I want you to want to close with this. If you'll join me in, in uh, uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13. Because Peter, Peter is this story of, of this apostle who grew like this. You remember some of the stories about Peter, how he failed and he was impulsive with his speech. I'll never deny you, Lord. And then shortly he denies him three times. Uh, and, you know, his, his failing a lot of times and, and how Jesus reinstated him. And, you know, I, if, you, if you love me, feed my sheep. And he had this heart. And, and, and I love the final picture of this about Peter as he became a spiritual parent. It's found in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13. The first part of the verse is, is really just some facts. He who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings. And I want you to note this. So does Mark, my son. So does Mark, my son. Do you know who that is? This is John Mark. This is the author of the Gospel, Mark. And, and you know, the story of Mark is amazing. Mark initially was on a mission trip and, and he failed. 
according to what Paul said. He failed miserably. And Paul was angry with him. In fact, it's found in Acts chapter 15. And, and Paul and Barnabas had this huge argument about John Mark. And, and John Mark was, you know, I, we don't know the details. He, he failed. He failed to do what he was supposed to do. And, and sometimes in church it gets ugly, doesn't it? And, and here we see Paul, he, you know, he was spitting angry. I'll never take John Mark anywhere. He failed. And Barnabas said, well, I'm going to take him. And you know where he took him? He took him and he met Peter. And Peter, becoming his spiritual father. And look at what happened. John Mark wrote a gospel with Peter. You know, I pray that you start to capture this is what the body of Christ is about. That we are to nurture people in. And I, I pray that we become more and more and more nurturing as a body. Welcoming new people, but with understanding that we are a part of helping them to grow up. I watched my friend Perry come in as a lost, broken individual. Horribly broken, just like Tim Peterson. I watched him over the years grow up. And I've watched him over the years disciple so many men. In fact, he discipled two of the men that are involved in leadership of the recovery ministry today. You know, this is the body of Christ. This is family. Remember Jesus' words. My brothers and sisters are the ones who do the work in the Word of God. Father, I thank You for Your precious truth of your body, the body of Christ, the church. Lord, I, I pray you help us to be intentional and committed to loving and nurturing people into this body, this unique creation that only you could make. Lord, I, I pray you give us the wisdom, the insight that only can be explained by your hand that we bring them in and love them in. And that we examine ourselves if there's any, any hate in us that we, we expel it through the power of Christ, through the power of your Holy Spirit, that it's gone. That we love people in and help them to grow. Help them to see the path that you have for them and join them. Lord, I, I thank you for this church, your church church that you died for, that carries the precious, most precious wisdom of God there ever, ever will be, the gospel. Lord, we love you. We pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Enjoy his grace today.